And then the third great reality, which defines our historical and geopolitical context, is the new phenomenon which I have been trying to emphasize in some of my writings and which I call the global political awakening. And that is the fact that for the first time in all of human history, for the first time in all of human history, most of humanity is politically activated, politically conscious, and politically interconnected. That's a totally new condition, which emerged just in the course of the last 200 years. It started with the French Revolution, which was the first case of an entire society being galvanized into political consciousness through struggle and violence, revolutionary collisions, but it involved the monarchy, the aristocracy, the church, the bourgeoisie, the peasantry. That never happened before. American Revolution was much more pacific in that sense, that it really didn't galvanize the same extent of social mobilization involving active, conscious commitment. It was much more limited in its focus, the desire of independence from the British Empire, from the king, particularly in the realm of taxation, but it didn't have all the other elements of social and ethnic activization. And that revolution then dominated Europe in the course of the 19th century, spreading through the awakening of nationalism to Germany, the spring of nations of 1848, and then the rise of nationalism in specific European <coughs> countries, Italy, Poland, Hungary, elsewhere, erupting then into World War I, 1914, and then spreading in the course of the 20th century, and especially World War II, to other parts of the world, the Far East especially, already early in the 20th century, and to other parts of the world, particularly the colonial world, because of the impact, mass mobilizing impact of World War II. And of course, the appearance in the meantime, first of all, of pamphleteering, facilitated by the printing press, permitted greater mobilization of the masses by agitators, mobilizers, revolutionaries, and then radio, television, internet, have interconnected us today in such a fashion that political demonstrations in Kyrgyzstan increasingly are emulated in Bolivia, or the Velvet Revolution in the Soviet world is imitated, let's say in the Philippines, and so forth. All of the techniques of social mobilization, protest, dramatization of aspirations, are now essentially universalized. So we're dealing with a globally politically awakened public. But what is very important in that context to recognize is that political awakening moves through stages, through stages of intense commitment. And particularly in its early phases, it's an extremistly, extremist militant commitment in which historical narratives are simplified to present a highly Manichaean picture of reality in which foes and friends are sharply demarcated and engage in titanic struggles and one's identity, whether religious or ethnic, is asserted in an absolutely self-righteous fashion and with a great inclination to the use of violence. Over time, that violence then saps that energy, teaches painful lessons about the benefits of compromise and these emotions subside as they have, for example, in Europe in the last half a century. But for the previous century and a half, Europe was the vortex of much of that violence. And of course, it spread elsewhere. And today we see this, this inclination towards extremism and fanaticism and the merging of ethnicity, nationalism, in its most acute form, sometimes with religion, is very evident in a part of the world in which the United States is engaged. And that brings me, therefore, to discussion of three major geopolitical challenges that the United States faces in that context. And I will try to give you a summary perception of them as I see them. But I would like also to invite you to think of what I am suggesting as the proper responses 
and I will certainly welcome challenges in regards to that, because these are issues that we as citizens should all be seriously concerned with and reflect on them in a responsible fashion, because these challenges are likely to determine, depending on how effective our response is or is not, the future of this country, in the world at large. But the future of America and the world at large will impinge, positively or negatively, in a very direct fashion, on the quality of life in the United States itself. And that's something one has to think about very seriously. The younger generation here will be living with the legacies of the decisions that are made in the near future. And our grandchildren will have their lives determined by how well or badly we perform on the global scene. So these are matters of the greatest importance, and I'll be very interested also to know what you think.